All right. We've looked at dice control now from the why. Why would somebody spend all that time, put in all that effort, spend their money learning a skill that quite possibly is unlearnable? Why? Well, you saw that if you can control that seven a little bit, if your mechanics and your set can target the box numbers a little bit, the financial possibilities of that are enormous. It, you can really understand why this is a goal that so many people are chasing and, and why it's you know, it's, it's enticing to go after it. But when we look at this from the other side, from the how, how do you get it done? It tells a whole different story. You need near perfection to be able to control the dice in any meaningful way. And nobody's helping you, right? The casinos have got rules in place that are designed to make sure you cannot control the dice. The table itself is designed to ensure randomness. And you're fighting a battle against the laws of nature, against physics itself. Bringing a moving body to rest in any kind of a, a controlled way, it's a battle. It's, it's nightmarishly hard to do. This is like a car accident, like trying to hold your coffee in a car accident. But in dice, there's three car accidents that happen on every shot. It's tough. Today, we're going to break down in slow motion a few shots. So you can see the violence at each stage of the impact. We're also going to take a look at the different surfaces and how different underlayments can impact the way that your dice bounce, stop, and come to rest. So it's going to be an interesting journey for sure. Um, let's get and explore it together. We're going to take a look deeper today at Epic Randomness. All right, let's jump right into this thing. So when the dice come to rest on the table, four things are going to have to happen, right? First, obviously, they're in the air. They're flying. They smack the table. That's the first impact. Then they rotate up into the back wall where they interact with the diamond plating on the back wall that sends the dice in random directions off those 45 degree angles. Then they come back off the wall in rotation, hit the table and roll to a stop again in the air to the table. First impact to the wall. Second impact back to the table. Third impact rolling to a stop. My God, there's a lot going on there that has to go exactly right. Exactly. Perfect for you to have any sort of control over the shot. Any imperfection in any one of those phases leads to more imperfection or more randomness in the next phase. So if they don't land perfectly square, or if they hit on the table at a slight angle, you impact the angle with which they hit the back wall, which makes that skittering more violent, which means when they come off the wall to land again, they're landing at an angle you weren't ready for. And again, they roll more randomly. Even the most perfect toss can impart the slightest little bit of imperfection into the bounce of the back wall and all bets are off. It's a really tough hill to climb. And again, the table, that back wall, they both fight you pretty hard. This is a war that the dice controllers wage with the hardware itself. And I want to take the next couple of minutes here and take a look at the hardware that you're fighting, the table surface itself and that back wall. So you can see exactly what impact they have on the dice and on your results. Let's start by examining the table itself. Now the tables, as noted here, 100% non-standard. And that's not on purpose. There's just lots of manufacturers that make tables. But what you run into are tables that vary from 10 feet to 16 feet in length. So when you're standing next to the stick man, say trying to get your shortest throw that you can to the back wall, that throw could be five feet. That throw could be seven and a half or eight feet away. It just depends on the table size. And to adjust to that in real time is a kind of a tough thing. The deck itself, in other words, the height of the surface of the table where the layout is itself can range from 27 to 29 inches, depending on, again, the manufacturer and how tall those legs are at the casino that you're playing at. Again, it's an adjustment to be made. Dice control relies on muscle memory. You're working hours and hours and hours and thousands of throws dialing this thing in at your home practice unit or your wherever you're practicing. Well, guess what? You go to the casino and now the deck is an inch higher and maybe the, the, the rail is a little bit deeper to the table than you're used to. Well, you're going to feel that it's going to hit you in the armpit instead of in the ribs. That's a big deal. If you're relying on muscle memory to get you through this and you don't find that out ahead of time, you show up at the table and go, Whoa, this is different. You have the dice for the first time and it's different and you have to adjust. Well, while you're adjusting, you're throwing randomly, whether you think so or not. I've also seen tables where the depth of the rail is quite different, where the padding and the two chip rails, I've seen them as, as skinny as eight or nine inches. I've seen them as, as wide 
as a foot and a half, where you have to really reach way over and down into the table to get your dice. I've had tables where I can stand flat footed and throw and tables where I've needed to be on my tiptoes to reach down and get the dice and throw. It's a huge adjustment. And again, I don't believe that the casinos do this in any way to, to, to impact dice control. It's just the, the tables that they bought and the style that they wanted. But we as dice throwers have to adjust to height, width, depth, and all of it to get through it. Tables also have different surfaces, right? They're not always made of the same kind of wood. Some of them are two pieces of plywood. Some of them are, are inch and a half birch. The table uh, at a casino near where I live actually has gone to a plexiglass surface with felt on top. And again, they do those things not to stop you or to hurt you. They do it for maintenance reasons. The plexiglass table at my local casino will last them 20 years. And that's why they went ahead and made that choice. It changes how the dice bounce. And it's an adjustment that we all have to make when we get there. And that's true of every casino based on where they bought the table, based on their maintenance schedule, based on the felt that they're choosing, the services are going to naturally be different. So again, it's non-standard. It's a thing to adjust to. And again, you're going to adjust to that as a dice thrower when you get there. And it may take you 20 or 30 rolls, two or three times around that table to get used to the table and have to adjust. Again, it's not targeted to stop you, but it's another barrier in your way that you have to deal with as a dice controller. So the table itself is the first barrier. The dice are going to impact that table and you have to throw from wherever you are at whatever distance, at whatever depth or height you're stuck at. So the table is the first battle you have to win. Okay. So let's peel back a layer here and look at the underlayment. So the underlayment is the material that lives between the hard surface of the table, the wood or the plexi or whatever it's going to be and the layout that you're looking at and you're playing on. Between there is some underlayment that's designed to do two things. One is the primary thing is to protect the bottom surface. If it's wood, the underlayment serves as a way to keep that wood firm and smooth and protected. It also gives a little bit of give into the surface to protect the felt on top so it doesn't get tore by the sharp edges of the dice hitting it. So it serves two purposes in that respect, which helps the casinos keep the tables you know, lasting a long time. They're there for longevity purposes. The side benefit of the underlayment is that no matter what it is, it's going to help impart some level of miscontrol onto the dice. And it's going to be a thing you have to deal with. Now, underlayments range from none. I've seen tables where it's just wood, a little bit of vinyl and the felt on top, and that's it. Very neutral bounce, easy to kind of learn and adapt to. It's the standard old craps table. There are a few of those that are left. Other casinos will use newsprint between the wood and the felt. And again, it's designed to help protect things. Side benefit is it's a little bit of a poofier kind of givey sort of surface. Some casinos will actually just lay the old felt on top of the new felt. And the more they do that, the thicker that layer gets. It gets more pillowy or mattressy. Um, Again, you're not going to find crazy random off of that, but you're not going to get a true bounce off of that either. It's going to be a little bit more give, easier to stop the dice on surfaces like that, but harder to control where they're going to land up. Then you get into the newer tables. And as we see here on our picture, the newer tables are using one of three core technologies, cork, neoprene, or closed cell foam. Now, neoprene is a form of closed cell foam, but it's more a little bit more open than closed. It's kind of a good mixture. Neoprene is basically a mouse pad or a wetsuit. Now, the cork surface, typically very thin, don't need a lot of cork to give a lot of bounce. Cork also has the property that you've seen in your cork boards that you've used with your push pins, nooks and crannies all over the place. And the edges of your dice will find the nooks and crannies. Every time it finds one, it's going to send your dice in a direction that you didn't intend for it to go, right? As a controller, you want your dice to hit flat, hit flat, and hit flat in a controlled overspin square direction. The minute they go off of that square, which Quark does a great job of because your dice will hit those things, you're no longer in control of your shot. Neoprene has the same effect, but amplified. At least Quark will absorb energy. Neoprene will not. Neoprene actually imparts negative energy onto the dice. So when they hit the neoprene, in whatever direction the impact is, if it's the corner of your die, the neoprene will spring your die in the opposite direction with new energy which is why on neoprene, a lot of times you'll see people throw the dice and they both bounce 90 degrees to the side and never hit the back wall. Or they'll hit the neoprene and check up and go backwards even sometimes. Neoprene's tough. 
Um, it's, it's almost impossible to keep your dice square on neoprene and keep that momentum going forward in a square fashion. So neoprene is really hard, but it's such a tough surface that those tables can last forever. Casinos love it. It's easy to clean. They last a long time, save some money. It keeps their brand looking great. And that's what it's about for them at the outset. The side benefit of it is it guarantees a little bit of extra spin. And the more spin there is, the less control you have. And that's what they're all about. Closed cell foam, the really tough stuff, the Valara, you're seeing less and less of that. There are a few casinos that still have it. But honestly, the dice, you've been at tables where the dice hit the table and they're off every third or fourth roll. That's the closed cell foam. The casinos are losing money on that because of rolls per hour being lost while they're chasing dice around. So those are becoming less and less. But I think the neoprene and cork are becoming more and more the standard for newer tables. Again, just like the table height, width, depth, and all of that, the underlayment is another thing that if you're a controlled shooter, you have to pay money to adjust to, right? There's no practice room at the casino. You get to show up, drop a grand on the table, and throw your dice and see how you're doing. You don't get to practice. You have to kind of figure it out as you go and you're paying for the right to learn the surface. It's really, really hard. Like I said, nobody here is trying to help you control the dice. You got to figure it out for yourself. And it's, again, the table, the underlayment, both are causing you lots of angst because there's no way to predict what you're going to run into from table to table. Okay, let's, uh, let's deal with this back wall. The back wall is the equalizer. It's the one thing without question that's there to stop dice controllers. You can't argue that point. Everything else, you know, the, the construction of the table, the height, the width, the, the, the size and shape, the underlayment, all of that can be, you know, reasoned away as stylistic or for maintenance purposes. I get it. There's side benefits to all of that. Um, but ultimately, the table has to live and last for a long time, and we get it. This thing right here... 100% is there to impart randomness on the dice. The casinos don't make money if the dice don't roll in predictable ways over time. This ensures randomness. That's the reason why it's there. It's the reason why there's a rule that says you have to hit it. You have to hit this thing every single time. Why does it cause randomness? Well, look at it. There's, there's five to seven rows of pyramid-shaped hard rubber that are going to, again, make your dice bounce in an unpredictable way. You've got to hit the bottom of a pyramid perfectly square or the point perfectly square to have any sort of control over what happens after it. And then it has to hit the table again anyway and still come to a stop. So this thing here is completely designed to stop dice control. And again, it goes along with the rules. You've got to hit the pyramid. You can't slide the dice into the back wall. You've got to throw it in the air. It has to hit the ground or the, the surface. And it has to hit that wall. So again, the rules of the game of shooting and this one implement are there purely to ensure that we have a random result on every single throw. It's a tough hill to climb. This is probably the toughest hill of all to climb. You can adjust to different table heights and widths. You can adjust to different underlayments and bouncy factors. It's really hard to deal with this back wall. And you'll see in slow motion here in a little bit, just what the impact of that back wall has on a moving die. So um, that's the third piece of it um, that shows the, the hardware parts. I want to show you now what it looks like in practice. Let's go ahead and peel back my layout. I'll change out the underlayment and show you what the different bounces look like on different types of underlayment. And then we'll take some slow-mo shots at this back wall. So stay with me. I want us to take a look now at the way the dice react to different underlayments. So we're going to start with cork. And before I get going, my table surface, as you can see here, is wood. It's actually inch and a half thick birch, which is super hard. It does a good job of reducing energy. It's actually the same surface that most casinos use. So on top of that, what I'm going to do is lay um, 1.5 millimeter thick cork on top of that, directly on top of that, a really thin layer of vinyl that would just kind of smooth things out. And then my layout on top of that. Now, casinos that do cork do a very similar thing. Sometimes they'll use uh, a thin layer of felt instead of vinyl. But in, in either case, we're going to get to look at the bounciness factor that cork provides or imparts in the dice versus a regular standard hard surface table. Okay, let's take a look at how the dice react on cork. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm doing some, some straight down drops 
I'm going to switch in a minute here to throwing the dice with backspin, with forward spin, and with more of a horizontal or helicopter tile style toss. So you can see the activity of the dice as they hit the table. What you'll find is that the corners of the dice tend to find those nooks and crannies pretty easily and bounce themselves sideways. Now, Cork does have the ability for you to control the energy. It does a good job of absorbing energy and slowing the dice down. So you don't have a ton of overspin. However, it's really difficult to control the direction. The dice almost never hit the back wall squarely because the corners or the edges will find those nooks and crannies and again, remove the element of directional control from you better than almost any other underlayment does. Next up is gonna be felt. So what I'm gonna do here is uh, take out my entire layout. We're gonna remove the vinyl, the cork, and put a layer of felt in. Now this felt that I've got, it's a little thicker than that cork was. It actually very has an old Vegas feel to it. An old, the older casinos where they would have used newsprint underneath their layout or maybe have layout on top of layout on top of layout versus swapping things out, just laying on top. The felt's got more of a soft, pillowy feel to it. The edges don't dig into this and go flying sideways, but there's definitely not a lot of energy reduction here because there's a lot of air in the felt. So the dice you'll see when they hit this are going to have a whole different reaction and spin to them and characteristic than they did with the corks. So let's go ahead and switch over and look at some felt drops and some felt tosses. Okay, let's take a look here at how the dice react on felt. The thing you'll notice that's the difference is that felt, the die will actually bounce pretty straight. You're not going to get that crazy sideways action that you got off of the cork. The difference though is that felt being so airy, the dice won't stop. And watch these things as they roll over and over again. They just don't want to stop rolling because there's nothing there to reduce the energy and make them slow down. That's the big thing with felt. It feels very old Vegas, fair, good, neutral kind of bounce, but they're hard to stop. Watch this one on the right side of your screen here on this last throw. It rolls over at least five or six times before coming to rest. And there it is. That is what makes felt so hard is, again, stopping them off the back wall. You're going to have that overspin, and it's just tough to control. Even though your directions are your direction is good, the energy is tough to control with felt. Next up is the nightmare that is neoprene. So let's go ahead and take our table apart here and swap out the felt for some neoprene. What I've got here is two millimeter thick neoprene. It's a giant mouse pad, essentially. It's going to be straight up neoprene. Then my layout, this table feels now like a brand new casino would. It's the exact same service as you'll see at most new casinos that have that bouncy service that we'd like to complain about. This is neoprene. Let's take a look at how the dice react on it. All right, let's watch the dice work against neoprene here. And what you'll see is I'm dropping them right now from about a foot away. And there's just no stopping these things. Whatever the edge hits, they just go flying in the opposite direction. They don't want to stop rolling. As you'll see when I transition here to doing actual um, shots, that when they hit the neoprene and go into the back wall, there's just no stopping them. They're going to want to roll and roll and roll because... Like the felt, neoprene is so loaded with air, there's almost no energy reduction at all. So getting these dice to stop is, is a challenge in and of itself. You'll watch these things as they hit the back wall here, and they just keep going. Most of the time, they're bouncing all the way off screen even. Um, that's two or three feet off the back wall, and I'm doing my best to keep these things as close as I possibly can. But you'll watch. They're going to roll over four, five, six, ten times before they come to rest. It's almost an impossible surface to, to predict and to control anything on. So again, there's neoprene for you. That's the new normal, it seems like. Um, and that's tough. And, and again, that surface itself, I think it's designed for longevity, but the side benefit is what you just saw here, which is complete randomness when the dice hit it. We're going to finish up here now with a return to normal. So what I'm going to do is swap out that neoprene surface and put in just straight up that black thin vinyl and my layout and have that be it. Um, this is going to mimic um, a neutral bounce hard surface table. There are still plenty of these out there. You just got to know where to find them. And this is what the dice control crowd is looking for. A fair, neutral, hard surface table that they can exert some level of control on. And when I show you how the dice react to this versus what you just saw in the neoprene and the cork and the felt, it's a pretty stark difference into how the dice react, come to rest, and bounce off of a 
neutral surface like this. Let's check out some drops and throws with the dice on this hard surface, the, the plain vinyl and wood surface. Now, what I expect that you'll notice here is that the energy reduction is pretty constant. When the dice hit the back wall, they'll pretty much come to rest almost immediately, like you see here. And you're not going to have typically the crazy sideways stuff that we saw with the neoprene and with the cork. Here, the bounces are pretty true. They stay square, and the dice will come to rest almost immediately after the hit. Now, those throws look pretty good. We're going to switch over to slow motion here in a minute and take a look at some slow-mo shots that look just as good from the overhead, just as good from behind. But when you see them in slow motion, you're going to see the breakdown because of the violence, because of the impact of the table, the back wall, and that second hit on the table. You'll see that even the best throw on the best possible surface still experiences an insane amount of randomness. Let's go ahead and switch over to slow-mo and, uh, and dissect a few pretty good-looking shots. Okay, let's get a look at a few random shots here. And what we'll do is we'll always start with this overhead view and I'll play them at full speed like this. You'll see the shot come in from the left. It'll hit the back wall on the right. It'll look pretty good, right? That's a good looking shot right there with a decent result. Now I'm throwing hard way sets here. So I expect to never see a one or a six. So actually that was not a great shot, but it looked good in real speed. At least it looked like it was under control. Now what we're gonna do is follow that up with a slow motion look at it. And what I want you to focus on in these slow motion shots is two things. One, did I land the dice flat? Okay, I told you in the very first part of this video that if any bit of the throw is off, if the dice aren't together, if they land just a little bit less than flat, every little thing that you do wrong is gonna impact the next phase. So a slightly off landing makes a slightly bad hit on the back wall which makes it worse on the second landing. So watch the slow-mo of this shot. You can see what I'm talking about. It looks like a pretty good release. The dice are pretty much together. As they come to rest, you'll see that that one on the right didn't hit square and it rolled over on itself a few times. It landed on the four, so it appears like a controller would say, oh, the right die was good, the left die imploded. Well, in fact, both of these die imploded like crazy because neither of them hit straight we got a good result, but it wasn't a controlled result by any means. Let's take a look at a few more shots, and you'll see that I'm going to do um, some helicopter-style style throws here, as well as some underhand-style throws as well, so you get a sense for how they all look. I'll do a little play-by-play -play for you, but really what I want you to do is watch these yourself and sort of make your own decisions as, as you see these things come, in, come into rest here. So there's another shot under slow motion. This looks like it's a helicopter style shot. And I threw this one, I think, pretty deep. You'll see that it hits about 12 inches from the back wall, but too much bounce. Look at that. Almost every face on both dice showed up. Now, it landed quick. Look at the overhead again. That thing landed and it looked really solid and quick. Watch this. Right? Bam, on that landing. It looks good. In slow motion, doesn't look so good. It's kind of a mess in slow motion. So you'll see that what looks good to the naked eye very often does not look great under the microscope. So there's that same one where both die every single face showed many times. In fact, they hit each other in the air on the way down to what looked like a three and a two, which is a good on axis shot. They were never on axis. Let's take a look at the next one here. Okay, those die came to landing quick. It's a four, five. So again, an on-axis result, no ones or sixes. Let's see how they look under slow motion. I think this one might be the underhand toss. No, it's another spinner. So they spin, they landed where they should have landed. They hit the back wall nice and low and came to rest pretty quick. But again, the ones and sixes did show as the dice came to rest. We lucked out and got a four or five. The thing about this shot that I actually like, we'll rewind it a little bit here. Um, was the amount of, of bounce or the lack of bounce off the back wall as they come to rest. So watch them hit the back wall, boom, boom, and they basically stop right there. There is that extra little roll at the end, but those that were under pretty good control, even though all the faces showed, we controlled the energy at least. Let's look at the next one. Okay, there's another 549. And again, not a lot of action off that back wall. Let's look at that again. I want to see how they, how they hit. 
Okay. Actually, that five rolled off that back wall pretty hard. The slow-mo on that one's going to be, I think, pretty ugly. Let's see what happens here. This is an underhand toss. So the dice is going to hit the wall spinning forwards, being propelled into the wall. And um, yeah, that thing bounces way too much off that back wall. The four actually hit and landed pretty much under control. It was actually a pretty good shot. The five, though, lost completely. It hit on a point, hit the wall badly, and it had way too much energy coming in. One more. Okay, again, another good looking shot from the overhead. Hits the back wall and dies almost instantly. They're about four inches apart, about two inches off the back wall. It's a beautiful shot from all intents and purposes. Let's take a look at the slow mo and how they reacted under the microscope. Another underhand toss here. They actually crossed over. Do you see that? They landed, both of them landed on their inside points and they crossed over in the air. I got an on axis result, right? You would say to yourself as a controller, good shot, three, two, they're both on axis. But guess what? The dice crossed in the air. They never hit the wall straight. Lucky result there. Um, I did like the energy again. I think it's the case to be made for this hard surface table where even if you get a bad bounce, they're not going to roll like crazy afterwards. So there is some measure of control that you get from a surface like this, but you can see in the air from the minute those things hit the deck, they were never under my control. Once they hit and they were not square, all bets are off. It's a random shot. Here's our last one. Okay. Six, five, yo, how's it show up on the slow-mo? I can see it already. Let's reload that screen there. And you can see almost instantly out of my hand, watch this, let's go back to it again. <clears throat> I'll show it one more time here. Out of my hand, you can see that they're not straight. The one on the right is actually flying at an angle and it crosses almost over the left eye. So again, every little mistake that you make is magnified. So were these to be perfect shots? Would they have landed on axis? Would they have hit square? I don't know. They weren't perfect because I'm human. And the mistakes that I made in my, in my controlled throws here showcase just how hard this is in the most perfect conditions possible. Even the slightest little mistake that die on the right was in this last shot was flying at maybe a one or two degree off of square. It was rotate. It was in the air a little bit off center. That's all that it took to make it cross over and cause a mess. Right? It doesn't take a whole lot uh, to make what seems like a pretty good looking shot to actually be kind of a train wreck underneath. So that's a, a good look at some of my slow motion shots. Now, I don't expect you to take just my word for it. I'm going to show you some slow motion shots from some actual professionals that do this and have practiced for thousands of hours that have perfect shots. I will show you two perfect controlled shots from highly respected controlled shooters, and we'll take a look at what they look like under the microscope. What I want to show you here is uh, a clip from a video put out by a YouTuber who goes by the name of Dewan. He is a amazing dice controller. When you see this video, you'll agree this shot is a work of art. And there's a things to call out here, right? When you see this dice in slow motion, you'll see they stick together perfectly. They rotate together perfectly. You can see the landing zone. He is beating the ever loving daylights out of this table. You'll see there's one spot where his dice are hitting clearly thousands of times. He's got this down to an absolute science, which is amazing. But I want you to take a look at what happens to his die when they hit the table and the back wall. And again, and compare it to what you saw me, the novice dice controller doing. Let's take a look here. First of all, a work of art. Look at those things spinning perfectly together. That's just beautiful. The same sort of action too, right? Off the back wall, they hit, and they come almost to immediate rest, just like mine were doing. It looks great. Now watch this one. Here's the slow-mo. Perfect. Boom. But what happens there? It's a bit of a car wreck, isn't it? Right? It looks in the air like a thing of beauty. Look at these things coming in. They are just perfectly together. They land perfectly flat. And then it's chaos. Every single face shown. 
Matter of fact, on the left-hand die, there's a two showing up, right? We know that an on-axis shot for a hardware set that this guy's using, you should never see a six. Right there on the left-hand die, the six is up. The six should never be in play, yet here it is in play. Now it lands and rolls over and we get a two, right? But that die was 100% off axis during the flight. From one of the best dice controllers that I've ever seen, look at that landing zone. Look at this up in here, the, the white part where those dice hit. This guy clearly has put in the time and effort to do this right, yet he encounters the same act of violence that I encountered when my dice hit the table. Those dice in the air and my dice in the air after impact look exactly the same. Let's break down a shot here from um, a dice controlling, I guess, professional. Goes by the name of Koga Ninja. He sells DVDs and videos and everything else. So ostensibly, he's a pro and knows what he's talking about. I want to break down this shot. He published this shot on his YouTube channel as sort of proof positive of his dice controlling abilities. Let's break this shot down. I'm going to start it off. I'm going to pause it partway through and then we'll pick it up here and we'll break it down uh, frame by frame. So here we go. And we'll stop it right there. So as you can see, just like the one, he's throwing the hard way set. We've got threes and fours and fives and twos and the sixes and ones are on the outside of the die. So if you're throwing the dice on axis, meaning they're spinning in that same direction, you really should never see the, the one or the six show up. These dice should hit and stay spinning on the three, four, and the two and the five, and that's it. Um, what you're going to see, though, is not that. What you're going to see is when these dice hit the table, watch the blue die in specific, please. It goes way off to the side. It rolls over a few times, and it lands on a two, which is a seemingly perfect result. If you're throwing the hard way set, you expect to land on two, three, four, or five, ideally landing on a hardware number like we have here. That looks like a perfect result, and it is, okay? But how perfect was the shot? I can tell you this, if I go back a couple of frames like the one, that right there is beautiful. They're a little tiny bit off kilter, right? They aren't perfectly married. The ones were perfectly married. These, as you can see, there's a, about a two or three degree difference in rotation on the two die, which makes it a little bit less than perfect. That might explain why the left hand die, the blue die goes bonkers. Watch this thing hit and it goes boom, like 45 degrees to the left it goes. And then it comes bouncing off that back wall. And I want you to count the number of times the ones and sixes show up on that die as it comes to rest. So here's, it's going to be, there's the one shows up right there on top. It's going to keep rolling here. I'm going to try and frame by frame it. There's the one, there's the one again. And there comes the six and then it comes to rest. So the one and the six showed up at least three times. I think there's one more in there that I skipped over with a frame. The, the, the faces that should never show showed up three times as that die came to rest. Now you got a perfect result, but I would argue that the blue die was never once on the intended axis. It ended up with an on axis result, but the die itself was never once on axis from the moment that it hit the table. And frankly, if you compared what you just saw on this video, that amount of off axis rolling from that die with what you saw from the one, his dice and his dice were perfect in the air, still had a, a, a major chaos after impact and mine, the most, you know, the, the newbie of the bunch here, um, all three of our shots looked exactly the same after they hit the table, hit the table chaos hit the back wall more chaos we all got good results out of it i can clearly point to my shot and say yeah there's all sorts of mistakes in the mechanics and you can see my dice are off center the ones i saw nothing wrong this one a one degree little mistake there in the, in the flight yet all three of us had the same amount of violence and the same amount of chaos following that first hit and more so after the hit on the back wall does the set that was used by any of, any of us have anything to do with what showed up on the faces that our mechanics impact it. If any of us had set the dice differently, would we have seen a different result? I would argue. Yes. If you set the dice differently and had the same exact throw, the numbers would certainly show up differently, but could you predict what the numbers might be? That's where it's hard to say what you're seeing here. And I think that the one and Kogan Ninja both put those videos out with the intent to prove 
A, their skill, which they clearly have the skill to throw these things perfectly, um, but also their ability to, to drive results based on the skill. That's the part that I'm having trouble with. And I think if you're honest with yourself, whatever side of the aisle you stand on here, you should be able to say to yourself two things. If you're a person that does not believe in dice control, you should be very impressed by what you just saw. By those two gentlemen being able to throw the dice with that amount of perfection, that's a work of art. And humans can do superhuman things. I've said it before. And those two videos prove what can be done with an expert with the dice. I think it's amazing. On the other side of the coin, humans can't control physics. You can't overcome the physics of those diamonds or the different surfaces of the table when the dice hit it. And that's part of the problem here. So I think what we got to see today with the different breakdowns of my um, slow motions and these professional slow motions, there's a, there's a dichotomy there with what's possible and what's likely and what's predictable. There's a, there's a def, definitely an imbalance, I think, that we're striking here now. So I think our next logical step here has got to be to rewatch these slow motion videos with more expert eyes. I think you and me, you know, we're for the large part novices in the world of breaking this kind of stuff down. There are definitely things that I look for when I see these slow motion videos. I'm very in tune with the energy off the back wall. As you know, I talk about this a lot. I believe that a controlled shot, a good controlled shot is really about controlling the energy and controlling how fast the dice come to rest and stop rolling after the back wall hit. And if you can control that bit of it to where they, they stop so fast off the back wall that only one or two of the faces ever were rolled over on, you've taken a bunch of combinations away, which can help hide the seven a little bit. I don't know yet that I'm anywhere near understanding how a dice set with that amount of chaos has anything to do with the results that you see. I think it's all about the energy. I can be convinced otherwise, but at this point, the takeaway that I have now after watching all that slow motion, especially comparing my lousy shots with their amazing shots and seeing the same level of chaos, I'm more convinced than ever that it's more, that it's about the energy and the role and less about the actual setting and controlling what numbers might show. I could be convinced otherwise, but at this point, that's where I am. So what I'm going to do is defer to some experts. I'm going to bring in some folks that really practice this stuff and understand what they're seeing. Let them watch the videos with us. We're going to have a little watch party and record that so you can see what they say. I'm also going to bring in folks from the other side of it and have them help break down the way that they see it. And even somebody who I know that um, knows a thing or two about physics that may help us break some of this stuff down. But again, at this point in my study of this topic, I'm honing more and more in on energy control versus number control. I think that's where I'm leaning but still have the open mind. So hopefully you'll stick with us here. We've got a few more videos to go in the series. Upcoming is going to be a breakdown of the university study where they built a robot to try and throw perfect dice. And the results of that are really interesting. Um, there's uh, a few interviews that I want to conduct with some folks that I know have studied this really intensely on the anti-dice control side. One of them actually was a big proponent and author of how to do dice control and is now talking about it from the other side a little bit. So that'll be interesting as well. So uh, stay tuned to the series. Um, there's much more to come on the topic of dice control, but I appreciate your time here watching this episode and helping us break down um, what it means to encounter this uh, thing we call epic randomness. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.